today at the Baton Rouge Airport. I'm here with Mike Shepard, president of the Louisiana Music Hall of Fame. We're going to talk about Mike's life in music and this wall of gold records that he's put up here at the airport to showcase our Louisiana music history. So I met you earlier this year and the more that I get to know about you and what you're doing for Louisiana music and Baton Rouge music, the more that I am just have so much respect for you and I'm just so impressed with everything that you're doing. And I so. want to thank you for taking an interest because honestly, we've had six or seven million people pass by one side or the other or both sides of this thing. And the number of TV stations that have bothered to interview anything about it, zip. Well, I am just so honored to be here with you to do this interview. I'm so excited to let people hear about you and what you're doing. So, so we are here in front of the Wall of Gold Records at the Baton Rouge Airport. So tell us about this wall and how it came into being and what this means for our city and our state. The first thing is how it came into being was Kip Holden, who I've known since the 60s, was mayor for 12 years. And Kip called me up one day and wanted to make a meeting that day or the next day. And uh, I met with Kip that day, actually. And Kip said, Mike, you know, we've known each other since the 60s. We're both old DJs. And we've been around the music business forever. You in it, me sort of in it. And he said, um, I'm renovating the airport. And while I'm renovating it, I love what you're doing, and I want to do something to help you in the Hall of Fame. What you got in mind? He said, I want to put some sort of display that will catch people's attention as they come through the airport. I said, you know, what floor, whatever you want to put it. He said, I'm thinking about the second floor because we got nothing in the middle of the second floor. So I thought about it for a while. A day or so, and I said, you know, we can make a wall of gold records. There's not one left in the United States. There used to be a dozen walls of gold records. There aren't any more. They're all gone. Wow. And I think I told you my inspiration for that was uh, mainly Florence, Alabama, which is the airport for Muscle Shoals, with all the recording studios and everything they've done over there which is amazing and they had a plastic glass whatever I think it was plastic at the time sort of uh, pyramid two sides and it was flat on either end and in one side of that they had a gold 45 of one bad apple by the Osmond brothers which was recorded in Fame Studios, which is a little north of Florence. And on the other side, they had Take a Letter Maria, recorded in Muscle Shoals Sound, which was a little bit to the east of Florence. And everybody was going, pointing to it and looking at it in a conversation piece. So, okay, there's something to this. That's amazing in Florence, Alabama you can have that much interest in something, even though they have the studios there that make. When I was there, they had just uh, finished a couple of albums. One was Joe Cocker. The other one was, um, what Rolling Stone? Brown Sugar, Sticky Fingers album at Muscle Shoals. That's pretty good. That's some good stuff they were doing. So I, I said, you know, a gold record display, and I did my research, and Nashville had taken their wall, you know, who knows where it went. Detroit had taken their wall down. Memphis had taken theirs down. So it was passe all of a sudden. Well, Baton Rouge is a little behind. Passe is new. <laughs> and they responded to it. So this is the only display like this that you know of left anywhere in the country. Yep. And this lets everyone know who comes through this airport that we're all about the music. Yeah. That's wonderful. Which is what Louisiana is all about. That is. People have told me there's two main tourism aspects to Louisiana. One is the music. 
which I totally agree with, and two is the food. It's hard to display the food out here. <laughs> That's true. So tell us about yourself. How did you become involved in music? Well, I started off with a grandmother and a mother who played piano. And there was a big spinet, dark, almost black, ironwood piano that was five feet high at the back in the house. I've always played on that. When I got to junior high school, I was into music, so I got talked into going to a place on Scenic Highway which taught musicians. So I learned clarinet and saxophone and played in the junior high band. That was the beginning. And as it went on, I decided that promoting concerts was not a bad thing to do. I think, think I did my first one in 1965, somewhere around 65. And I went on to have a couple of teen clubs. One was called It's Boss A Go Go <laughs> on Florida Boulevard. And they served near beer and non-alcoholic apple cider. I managed to have a couple of groups then. Uh, the Music Machine had a big song called Talk Talk. And the Amboy Dukes, Ted Nugent. Uh, group out of Texas called Sam the Sham and the Pharaohs, Wooly Bully, and a couple of other groups. And the, the one I liked was a group from Indiana. And I'm still friends with the guys. Saw him two years ago or less. His name is Rick Derringer. And his original band was called the McCoys. Hang on, Sloopy. Rick was good. The McCoys turned into a backup band called And. It was then Johnny Winter And. The And was the McCoys with Rick. And then Rick wrote a song for Johnny called Rock and Roll Hoochie Coo. And I had them here at the Lakeshore Auditorium, Independence Hall, it came to be. And before that, I actually had the first show at Independence Hall that was rock. I mean, a couple of people had brought James Brown, Dixie Wrestling, stuff like that. I sort of broke the mold a little bit and brought a group called The Animals. 1966 January and the hall was not ready for that so you have worked in like every possible aspect of the music industry you were a musician and a songwriter you were also did booking and promotion management and producing and um, audio and video production and since 2005, you've restarted the Louisiana Music Hall of Fame, yeah. and you've managed that. And to be honest, you're like a walking history book. Whenever I talk to you, I always learn something new about Louisiana well, music history. I started the Hall of Fame. My intent, among other things, was to give back to where I came from. Yeah. These are the people I was raised with, basically. Because I started playing music at 13 or 14. Right. So with all of this music industry background and everything that you know, what do you think Louisiana can do to help people everywhere see what an amazing music community we have here? Two words, spend money. This wall is here because the mayor of Baton Rouge was an old friend and a DJ and loved music. And he made this happen because of that. Now, New Orleans is building a multi, multi, multi-million dollar new terminal. I dealt with them for a while, they were all good. Then they raised the price of the terminal by 
50 million or 60 million. I haven't heard from them since. Lafayette's interested, but they're not really serious about spending any money. And I say, guys, I can do this, but it costs money. I don't have the money. I've put a ton of money into the Louisiana Music Hall of Fame as it is, and I'm doing the state of Louisiana's job. And the state of Louisiana has not yet paid one penny toward promoting music with anything meaningful. To me, this wall is meaningful because six or seven million people have seen this wall, passed by it, commented on it, went, wow, taking pictures of it. That's well worth its weight in gold. Yeah. Records. <laughs> gold records. <laughs> so you grew up here in Baton Rouge. And so I'll, what is your favorite thing about Baton Rouge? My favorite thing about Baton Rouge is it's a good place to be. It's quiet. Um, you think in the music business, I want to go clubbing all the time. Not true. I'm not into that. And you said I've worked in all these things. That's the thing I've worked. So um, the Louisiana Music Hall of Fame. Uh, your friend Del Moon started the Music Hall of Fame in the 1980s. But after a few years, it wasn't able to continue due to funding issues. And then you restarted it in 2005 with a different approach. Um, so what is your dream and your vision for restarting the Louisiana Music Hall of Fame? Well, Dell's original idea and my original idea was our artist, you can see some of these people on the wall, started music, rock and roll, some of it blues, rhythm and blues. Not necessarily the blues, I haven't gone so far back since bring in the 1890s New Orleans guys that did actual jazz and blues back then. Except Mahalia, she's a little later. But um, our idea was to keep these people alive in memory. And our mutual idea, mine as much as his, because I grew up with them, was to honor these people, to give back to the place I came from. Now, Dell, like he said, came from California and played a trombone. He didn't grow up with them, but he knew that we had the oldest musicians in any state, any state, because our guys started the music. And over there in one place, we have Lead Billy. Lead Billy started, he was known for years as the father of folk music. He's actually the father of rock and roll. Yeah, the, re the original record, he did records in 12, 1912, and 16, and things like that. And I've got a thing called Good Rock and Tonight, which has, it's called the true history of rock and roll, Louisiana. And it's a 1918 song I put on CD. He originally put it out as in New Orleans because the Library of Congress didn't think he wrote it. They thought it was an 1860 song that he put his name on. In 1940, they sent a check for two or two hundred fifty dollars, and said, "We're sorry, we're giving you credit for this song." And he re-recorded it then and put the title on it, "The House of the Rising Sun." It's 1918, Louisiana. There's a gold record of Lead Billies right up there. From 1930, he recorded in Angola Prison with a chorus of inmates singing behind him. It's a 12-string guitar player. And that song is called Midnight Special, which is all about prison life. And that's how far back we go in music. So tell us about your website. You have an immense website. It's uh, like a virtual museum. I've heard you reference it as, and it's got so much history available for people to see online. I, I heard you say that it's got thousands of images, 
five or six hundred hours of multimedia and over a thousand pages of music history info. Tell us about that and how that got developed. I'm an idiot who built it. I didn't know how to build a website. But I figured it can't be that hard to learn. I didn't realize how much time it would take to actually do these things. I'm sort of a graphic artist. This is all my creations art-wise. And that transferred down to websites. I knew the content. My father was a writer. I was raised in writing. I can write. And the music, I sort of know. So it, it made sense. Rather than pay somebody money that I didn't have at that point, I'd just take on and start building the thing. And we didn't start with 100 to 200 to 300 inductees. We started in 2014 with seven. And some of those were pretty good. Irma Thomas, Carnival Time, Al Johnson, Robert Parker from Barefootin', Jimmy Clanton from Baton Rouge was in the first group of inductees. So it started with a seed. That website as of today has almost two and a half million visitors. Yes, it does. That's pretty strong for some that started with one. Two and a half million is pretty good for a website that yeah. from nothing. It is very good. Okay, so what are the criteria for someone to be inducted to the Music Hall of Fame and what is the process? The criteria is, in my opinion, and it's always been my opinion, if you make a criteria, people are going to lose you. They do that anyway. With, well, I've been playing for 33 years. I played in two bands as a bass player and I was involved with a guy who had a country record one time. And I've been asked, is it a gold record? Is it a number one song? You can't really make a criteria that's going to fit the new musicians that need to be honored. Uh, Carnival Al Johnson is up here. Carnival Time, the song. Al, that didn't sell a million records. It didn't make Al a penny. It made a penny four years after he did it because he was in the army at the time and he couldn't get a penny from it. The record labels just didn't pay him because he was in the army. So the gold record sort of out the window. Uh, number one record is out the window because it was like I think number four or five in New Orleans for years. So neither of those work and you're making it about money when you do that is my feeling. You make it about record sales or chart sales or gold records, it's making about money. For Mid Billy. Mid Billy never had a gold record. He never made any money off of them. But he started so many songs. Uh, Good Night Irene, you ever heard of that? That's a Lead Billy song. Good night, Irene, Irene, good night. I'll see you in my dreams. Um, you can't pigeonhole it. It just, it's not going to work. So to you, it's about the impactfulness that that person had on Louisiana music. Like I told Ethan John at NOCA, New Orleans Central Concert Association, where I inducted Deacon. Deacon. He said, why am I in here? I said, Deke, look at it this way. Call it a Lifetime Achievement Award. Open in. Fair enough? Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> so that's sort of the best description I got out of it. Okay, wonderful. So how does the Louisiana Music Hall of Fame receive funding, or hmm. does it? That's a problem. <laughs> because, as I said, we're doing the job of the state of Louisiana. They haven't paid one penny. Not a penny. Not to me, not to Dell, nothing. So you're basically funding this project on your own, and it's a big labor of love for you at this point. Unfortunately, it's not a great idea. Right. And I've been able to make money doing other things that I do, like some engineering, some graphics, some video. 
So. All right. Well, thank you so much for being here with us today. And um, everyone be sure to check out Mike's show that is here in Baton Rouge on Wednesday nights at the Hollywood Casino. And it's called Good Rockin' Tonight, and he has interviews and performances with uh, Music Hall of Fame inductees. And you can learn more about Baton Rouge music history by attending those shows. And all the shows are on YouTube. And all of the shows are on YouTube. Where anybody can go watch them. It's free. Yes. It's not stuck with TV. Yes. And you just have to type in GRT for Good Rockin' Tonight, GRT space... L M H O F Louisiana Music Hall of Fame space, and that'll bring up all the shows. There's 20 of them or so. Okay, great. And everyone, you can visit Louisiana Music Hall of Fame org. Find out more information. And see whatever you want to see. All right. Thank you so much. This Thank is you, great. Caitlin.